main speaker today is David Gorman. He has 25 years of leadership in finance, investment, entrepreneurship, government, and philanthropy. He served the Commonwealth of Australia as Senior Investment Director in New York under the government of Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. David's finance and investment career began with Morgan Stanley and Bear Stearns, where he enjoyed experience in global equity, fixed income, and alternative asset class markets. In 1998, he helped his partner, Jim, establish their swim school, which teaches 2,500 students each week in New York City and Houston. A graduate of Columbia University, sorry, David speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and French. He studied Italian, Japanese, and Russian. A native of Miami, David resides in New York City with Jim and their two rescued Great Danes. David served on the board of Stop Drowning Now, a nonprofit that seeks to end drowning through education and public advocacy. With no further ado, I would like to invite my dear friend and um, today's speaker, David Gorman, to the screen. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and having me today. Um, communities such as yours are so important, um, especially in days of uncertainty like we're in now. And uh, I'm grateful to see all of these new faces, uh, particularly in Houston, for which um, I have a great deal of affection. I'm a native Miamian. Um, uh, but my partner, Jim, he happens to be chauffeuring me. He is a native Houstonian, and he and Terry um, first met uh, about the time of the Revolutionary War, or was it the Civil War, um, when they were teaching at uh, Springwoods High School. So um, I am going to speak today about the um, economic and uh, the socioeconomic elements of the time we are in um, and that we're working through, particularly after the pandemic. Many of the uh, elements that we face have been with us for a very long time and are not only creature to the United States, but other countries mature um, around the world. Um, I am going to share my screen starting right about now. And uh, I am going to take you to some slides. Okay. Abhishek, do I come across all right? Yes, it's good. Okay, very good. So I'm calling today, um, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. I was a history major and um, I found it so useful over my years to understand a, a context, understand a little bit of um, how things unfold through human behavior um, and that'll help us kind of frame um, what we're going to talk about today. So the key takeaways I hope to leave you with and keep you thinking about is why our economy and society can recover, how history points the way, not perfectly, but directionally. There's some similar things, although the circumstances in our politics and our culture really um, dictate that. Um, and then what are the challenges and signposts as we recover um, from this COVID-19 era? So let's talk about who is this panjandrum. Um, that means me, I like uh, fancy words, I find great power in language. And so this is one that I picked up and I thought would be interesting um, to kick things off. Um, as Terry mentioned, I uh, learned this stuff in the financial world first. I worked for very large organizations, Morgan Stanley and Bear Stearns. I went then to uh, Arden Asset Management, um, which was an independent, privately owned uh, hedge fund firm. And then I did some smaller uh, organizations um, for shorter periods of time, including investment work on my own. I also work for the Australian government. Now, obviously, you can tell from my accent that I am not Australian, um, but Australia is very practical and they recruit um, uh, foreign nationals to work in their um, offices abroad to help them with skills they don't have and also save costs. My work there was in foreign direct investment, foreign affairs, 
domestic policy and towards the very end um, I got to work with um, some of the leading politicians, the leader of the opposition, um, which I met through working with two previous prime ministers in the Labour, uh, the Labour Party. So my investment experience um, uh, has been uh, Kind of some very common things that you probably have in your own investment portfolios and some esoteric things like credit default swaps, uh, MBS, RMBS, um, futures and forwards, multi-currency credit facilities, holding company revolvers, but then things that might be more familiar like cattle ranching. I did a cattle ranching project in um, central Queensland. Um, I did a, a fashion startup here in New York by a guy who, uh, one uh, project runway twice. So it's really been very interesting to have a, a very big um, diversity of experience and see what the common elements are and what the differences are. Um, Terry mentioned earlier uh, Swim Gym. We have uh, five locations in New York City and we have uh, one, soon to be five, um, in Houston. We're over on Wilcrest uh, between Briar Forest and Memorial. So again, uh, I get to come to Houston frequently. I've been coming a long time and I enjoyed the city very much. It's a very underappreciated city in the United States and the world. So let's look at some history and basic economic truths. Major social and economic disruptions are common in the world. So Looking at the last century, we had the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed uh, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. We had the Great Depression, which was a global eruption in our economy for a variety of reasons. We also experienced world wars. And here in New York, we experienced September 11th, 2001. In each case, um, and even in recent cases like the uh, global financial crisis in 2008-2009, fears and panic were rife. There was radical economic and social transformation predicted, yet the global economy recovered to growth um, and uh, societies evolved. It was not a complete return to what it was like before, but it continued, um, we continued to grow and adapt to new conditions. You will see in the background that my two assistants there are Aries and Apollo. Um, I don't expect them to make any noise, but they may, you may see a Great Dane poke their nose in any moment. Specific examples of the, um, uh, the changes, the challenges, the crises we work through. Um, I'll have one here in Houston, the 1980s oil bust when Jim and Terry first met. Jim at the time first worked at Phil Hansel Swimming Academy, which was over um, in uh, the River Oaks area. During this period, revenue fell 12-15%, which was material. Um, those of you who remember and were in Houston at the time, gas was 60 cents a gallon, which is pretty remarkable. Here in New York very recently in the global financial crisis, um, we saw a huge amount of uh, 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 layoffs, uh, terminations, um, unemployment overall, uh, destruction of wealth, and our company's revenue fell about the same amount as um, Phil Hansel's did in the 1980s. Um, what I say this, uh, the reason I bring these up is, is that Houston has recovered. It is a hugely dynamic and fast growing city. New York has recovered and both are stronger than they ever have been. So there were many, many years of growth and, men, and um, we were responsible, society was responsible, the adaptability of the human animal was responsible. So the reason of why are some familiar um, things to us, basic human needs and instincts. That is in turn um, drives population growth and consumption. Um, and then that in turn uh, drives competition and innovation. And we'll walk through each of these in turn. Our hierarchy of needs um, is very well known. This was uh, uh, first conceived of by Maslow, the social scientist. Um, increasingly, as we have more advanced and wealthy and um, peaceful societies, we first meet our uh, 
our physiological needs, we need our safety needs, um, the love and belonging, our fr uh, families, friends, um, other sense of connection um, to society like the Houston Oasis has today. We have esteem for ourselves and um, our um, individual communities. And then self-actualization, those things that call us via um, philanthropic work, via our spirituality, um, via civic work to be our better selves. Now, the reason is, is because we focus on survival. We do the basics first. We breathe, we eat, we try not to be eaten. So as this wart warthog is uh, finding with the cheetah, um, best to stay alive in order to provide for your children. And then that allows us to move up to uh, reproduction, security, family, etc. Now this is a, a baby warthog called Gus. Completely coincidental that I happened to find a baby warthog at the Houston Zoo. So a little one of your uh, youngest Houstonians uh, making an appearance. But the interesting part of this is, is for us to think about the basic things that motivate us as animals also motivates us in terms of how we develop our economies and how we drive forward um, in returning to uh, stability and growth. That brings us to how populations grow, but also um, in terms of our consumption. Uh, some of you may have seen population pyramids, uh, such as this one. Um, it uh, delineates by age cohort what um, our population currently is by some very simple age groups for men and for women, men on the left and women on the right, um, and how uh, our population distribution looks across the country. So you will see that um, we have a decent distribution across age groups. You'll notice that we are extending our um, longevity into the 90s and even into the hundreds. And then you'll notice a little bit of a contraction down at the bottom where we have fewer um, four, zero to 10 year olds than we do 25 to 29 year olds. So this is not great, but it's also not terrible. But um, if we had looked at the population um, pyramid, the demographic period for 1950, it would have been a pretty, pretty straightforward um, uh, triangle. However, the top uh, uh, ranges, the top cohorts of population age um, would be non-existent because population um, uh, expected lives were much, much shorter. If we look at a population like Japan, we see that their um, demographic pyramid is quickly inverting or slowly as time goes by. This is a little bit earlier than the United States one, but you can see that among the 40 to 44 and the 65 to 69 cohort, um, they are much more uh, uh, populous than at the zero to you know, 34, 39. This, means that Japan's population is actually uh, people who lived in Japan who are of Japanese uh, descent or Japanese themselves. Part of this is because um, Japan is um, highly insular um, and uh, has uh, many cultural values that make um, inward migration challenging. So the reason that population growth and the ages of our population are very important is that human consumption um, drives economies. Here in the United States, about 70% of our economy is driven by us, driven by human beings who buy stuff for our children, we buy stuff for our pets, we buy cars, we buy homes, we buy tchotchkes and de decoration for Halloween. That is the basis for which we both try to make our lives better for ourselves, our children, and our families, but also um, it helps to create the income and the wealth that really um, gives us um, a strong economy. The US economy today is about 25 trillion. Um, we probably have shrunk a little since the COVID crisis, maybe a trillion dollars, but we're still the, uh, if not the largest, the second largest in the world behind China. So, what we need, um, certainly as the U.S. illustrated a little bit, and um, as 
Japan illustrated in much more urgency is we as a society need more babies and we need sustainable immigration. For example, um, immigrants will typically fill jobs that um, the growing population of the United States needs um, and that frankly we don't want to do. Home health care aids is an example of one. Food processing um, is another. Uh, yes, there are jobs available, but they're typically in jobs that people with higher levels of education, people who have started in the United States, they don't want to do. So we need, I'm sorry, we need to have some sort of sustainable immigration. And I think that that will probably be, the research I've seen suggests that that will probably be um, really the only offset to um, higher organic population growth, making babies. The young people today, um, that will be many of um, this group's children and grandchildren, um, are highly unlikely to um, have uh, many children of their own simply because our generations uh, younger than us very well may, may be the first that have uh, lower um, quality of life, lower growth than we have. So competition and innovation is really what helps make um, an economy much more efficient. Um, there's pluses and minuses to competition and innovation, but overall it helps make us wealthier, it gives us um, goods and services at lower prices, and allows us to have an increasingly strong quality of life. Competition pushes us um, to find growth. I like to say the effect of competition on an economy is very simple um, and similar to how com competition would um, impact an athlete like Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps didn't win 22 gold medals competing against himself. He was um, pushed by other people competing with him um, to make him seek better, stronger, faster. Competition always also requires us to be honest. It, it helps us understand what we um, need to do ourselves, that the other party, the other competitors are going to be on their toes to try to develop or gain an advantage. And so when an employee of ours, Kyle Shaw, he's the one in the uh, Power Rangers suit, has this other gentleman's fo foot, the other gentleman is going to have to be pretty honest with himself whether or not he is going to be able to uh, get out of this and uh, be a little bit more comfortable. Great companies um, are born during these crises. Great companies have um, come from entrepreneurs and visionaries who see things that a lot of us don't, that they have a different emotional um, makeup or vision, um, and they are able to meet the needs of consumers almost before the consumer knows that they need them. Walt Disney started um, in a very depressed time in uh, our history and economy. Charles Revson started Revlon in 1932, um, also at a similar low point for consumption for a variety of reasons for economic growth. The other companies you will recognize, each of these started in tough economic times. Disney recognized that during the, the depths of the Great Depression, that people would enjoy and, and even need to be able to go and pay a quarter or whatever it was to see an a, a, a animated movie like Snow White um, so that they could escape for a little bit, enjoy some climatized air if it was invented at that point, I'm not sure. Um, and to have a little bit of pleasure at a low cost um, and deliver that to vast amounts of people. I would say it's um, pretty amazing if you think about it that Snow White, when it was released, um, generated um, in today's dollars about $150 million. Talk about a blockbuster, right? Charles Revson saw that um, during the interwar years, that when times were, were tough, that um, women may not uh, be able to buy um, uh, some expensive clothes, but they may be able to spend 50 cents or a dollar on a new lipstick. So these leaders, again, developed 
knew that valuable products and services are always in demand. Consumers want to have things that make the, their lives easier, their lives more efficient, or things that give their spirit or their family pleasure. They understood the times in the context of what people could and could not do, and they understood the client's emotions um, and instincts, the hierarchy of needs, a little bit better before the client did. They saw that how people needed to be fulfilled, especially like my examples of Disney and uh, Charles Rosen. Um, they understood what motivated human behavior. They understood how folks going up that triangle needed to be helped. And they also reinvested for the long term. They continued to develop um, new products and services, and they continued also to make mistakes. They took risks. That's what entrepreneurs do. That also drives economic growth. So what are our challenges today? What are the things that um, we must overcome, address, um, innovate around, develop uh, workarounds that, that we have to think about today? Some familiar, uh, some are familiar, some are not. The familiar ones to us are aging populations in developed countries. We already touched on that in the United States and Japan. We have young populations in emerging country, uh, countries. Um, India is very much a country that has um, a young population. Uh, Nigeria has a, a hugely um, uh, young population and it's also growing in wealth and um, in speed. We in the developed markets, we have mammoth debts. Um, our national debt is probably uh, of almost the size of our gross domestic product, our total economic output each year. And we also have um, a lot of what we call off balance sheet debts. Social security is one of them. The debts um, that come from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and the other mortgage guarantees, those are other ones. Um, we also face domestic and international political uncertainty. Um, everyone knows, no matter your political orientation, your political preference, that this has been a um, highly volatile past few years. Um, that has been the case internationally as China has grown in wealth and power. Um, and there have been um, struggles with the European Union and the withdrawal of the United Kingdom. There's also been a very much a widening gap between uh, the rich and the poor. That's not only in emerging markets, but that's also in um, uh, developed markets like ours. If you um, have watched a Biden town hall recently, you would have seen that he spoke about a K-shaped recovery recovery where the economy post-COVID has done very well for the very wealthy, the top 1%, really the 0.001%. And then the um, rest of us have struggled. It has, not, it has been a time of great uncertainty and great risk. We have more and more religious and ideological conflicts. We have nationalism that we struggle against. Um, we have continuing um, conflicts in the role that uh, uh, religion plays in our society and other society. These are things that Samuel Huntington maybe 30 years ago said are the clash of civilizations, the class of culture. They are very hard to overcome because looking at the Middle East, looking at Israel, there's not a lot of middle ground if I am a Muslim and, or I am a Jew and we have the same holy ground that we each feel that we should claim. And then lastly, what we're in right now, plagues and pandemics like COVID-19 and MRSA. We have been through this before. We have been through all of these before and um, it is rocky, but we have surpassed them. We have some truly um, unfamiliar ones that we must also address and overcome. Man-made climate change is chief among them. Massive global population is also uh, chief among them. We have um, in the next uh, couple of years, we will have uh, more population growth in one year than the entire of civilization for several centuries. I don't remember what the exact um, uh, statistic was, but um, almost 8 trillion people, which I think that we will um, reach sooner than um, expected. We have incredibly long lifespans also uh, with the
populations. The lifespans um, have largely been driven by medical innovations, um, by very simple things like washing hands and antibiotics. Um, but uh, we never had in scale, in volume, the uh, sheer number of people in their 90s, their hundreds, and some people say that we will enter into our 110s um, in the not so distant future. Myself, for Jim, for Terry, um, for many of you here, that is actually on the table. We have energy uncertainty and yet high demand. Eight trillion people need energy to drive um, healthcare, to drive education, to drive sanitation. We have technological warfare that we have never seen before. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, nanites, drones. These things have not sort of um, mainstreamed their way into our lives yet, but in many ways it's here, um, but it, and it's definitely coming. We also have information warfare um, with speed and scale. Now, propaganda has been around in every single war. Um, my grandfather was a World War II veteran, and he talked about how there were radio, how there were leaflet droppings to um, manipulate the emotions of uh, uh, opposition troops, of, of uh, uh, allied troops. So it's not new, but the thing that is new is the speed at which it's delivered to us via our devices, as well as the um, volume that can reach us, how, how it can be real or how it can be fake, deep faked. This is relatively new because our brain chemistry, our brain mechanics really struggle to um, process all of this information and know what to believe. And then, I don't know, 2020 has been a strange year. Will we have a It's only October. It is entirely possible that we will. Um, obviously, I'm kidding, but um, when we had the murder hornets, anything seemed uh, to be possible, right? How will we overcome them? How will we overcome all of these challenges and get back to um, whatever the new normal is, whatever the new um, growth is? The answer is, we don't really know yet. We as a society and as an economy, generally make build the airplane as we are on the runway. We have to react very, very um, uh, quickly to new things because we can't tell the future. And we have to remember and be very humble, be very respectful that success is not guaranteed. Nations have risen and fallen. Civilizations have risen and fallen. That can be from the um, uh, several Egyptian empires, I think that there was 29 of them, um, to the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Sumerian Empire, to most recently the British Empire, the Russian Empire. These things do happen, they do change, and um, they are unpredictable if the leaders and the population, people like us, get too comfortable. But they can also grow and they can also evolve. Going back to the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom has been absolutely remarkable in its um, awareness, its acceptance, its development of how um, it must respond to um, changes both among its population um, in, the, in the physical UK itself, but also what was formerly called um, the British Empire. Um, and the United States, we're right there. You know, we were our role is changing in the world. Um, our role will continue to change. Um, and um, it is because we've faced so many things that are uncertain, it will also be a process of discovery. So I close this presentation by saying hope is not a strategy. We cannot hope for the best. We must participate in um, uh, civil life like the Oasis does for each of you today and every day. We must participate in our political life, whether we are um, uh, doing uh, political volunteerism at the national level, the state level, the municipal level, even running for our neighborhood or HOA uh, uh, council. We must participate. That is the nature of democracy. And as Winston Churchill said, um, democracy is the least worst form of government that we have ever had. So um, it will never happen here is uh, 
denial and we can deny things on a um, massive social scale. But the only way that we can um, possibly overcome this um, and get on and take our next step forward, I'd like to say, please vote on November 3rd, whoever you vote for, please get out and vote. Please encourage your family, friends, um, neighbors to vote. It is essential for us to participate um, and it is essential for us to express um, who we are, and as um, Terry said when she first opened the session, to put people first. This is my contact information. I encourage you to um, direct uh, uh, any comments or questions you have um, to me or through Terry. Um, and if there's time now, um, can I take some questions? How do we proceed at this point? Well, what we're going to do is go into breakout room for about five to seven minutes and where everybody can talk about what, say hello, talk about what you've, uh, you've said and then come back for Q&A. Thank you so much. We are going to open up for anyone with questions or anyone who wants to mention an idea that your breakout room came up with. As always, please keep your questions and comments brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. We know everyone is muted, so if you have a question or comment, please raise your hand and we will unmute you. I believe you may also have the ability to unmute yourself. So, I believe Richard, Dr. Richard Andrews had a question. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. That was very interesting. Um, with your exposure to uh, different countries around the world and that kind of stuff, uh, what, um, good models have you seen for moving economies in the direction of being more sustainable, like environmentally sustainable? That's a very good question. So environmental sustainability is still very new um, in terms of the political discourse generally around the world. I would say the, uh, there's also a lot of folks who don't believe it's an issue or they believe that it's overblown, but I would say we can look to New Zealand as a very good example. Um, we can look to Singapore as a very good example. Um, they have a great deal of um, innovation because they have it culturally, they have it politically, and so forth. Um, uh, Australia has not done a great deal of, uh, good, of a good job um, because they, coal has been a large part of the economy and there's a very significant coal lobby there. And, um, but I would say in the political sphere, Australia has gotten a lot of things right. Um, the single most important one I would point to is compulsory voting. And so every Australian, once they reach the age of 18, I think is the voting age, um, they're automatically re registered to vote. Every Australian um, immigrant who receives Australian citizenship is automatically required to vote. And um, it, it's, uh, there's, a ta there's a penalty. If you don't pay it, I think you, if you don't vote, then you get uh, uh, a tax of $250 or something. Um, and you don't have to vote for any of the candidates. You can vote for Mickey Mouse. You can vote for nobody. It's up to you. So those are the, the, the single most important one. Uh, Australia also has an extraordinary system of health care, of um, retirement income, um, and uh, bankruptcy laws, which I won't go into today. But those are two, of course, that I know very well. Um, I think that there are probably some others around the world who do well, but there's also plenty that don't particularly in the um, environmental and conservation. All right, thank you. Uh, Barun had a question. You want to unmute yourself and ask? He doesn't have a microphone, so we can ask the question. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Okay, so uh, the question, uh, Baron asked the question, uh, Brexit seems to be a UK reaction against globalization and Europeanization. Uh, this does not seem to be very adaptive to the UK's diminished role in from the heyday of the British Empire. Does uh, Brexit disprove your assertion that UK has adapted to its post-World War role, power role? Sure, so you can argue that. Um, you can argue that that is um, an expression of it in one way. I would also assert, though, that 
um, the independence of Britain from the, uh, the European Union is not a new thing. It's a very old thing. It is from the very day days of the formation of the European Union. In fact, Margaret Thatcher said, no, no, no. That was her, uh, her uh, response to having um, not only a political union, but a economic union. And so um, none of these issues are black and white in many, in, in many ways. And so I think that what the expression of um, the UK's broad desire to um, leave the European Union completely is uh, related to globalism. Um, it is also related to um, much of the um, internal management of the country for places um, outside of London and a handful of other cities. So um, if we go to London, I guess we'll wait. Uh, it's probably going through a tunnel. Probably so. <laughs> we'll wait a couple minutes. Uh, please continue posting your questions and uh, we'll Okay, there he is. Sorry about that. Did I cut out for a moment? Uh, yes, but you're back. Oh. Is he gone? Uh, no, I think it's uh, it's a connection issue. Right. Yes, please uh, continue posting your questions and there. I'm back. Sorry about that. No problem. So uh, just, just, to, just to wrap up on the UK, a um, lot of a uh, lot, lot of um, sentiment that it's not the Britain that many people um, recognize, and thus they voted to leave the uh, European Union because it wasn't working for them. Okay, so the next question. Okay, Susan has a question. Be sure to unmute Susan. yourself. There we go. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Um, so some of the some of the some of the uh, obstacles, some of the things that need to be uh, gotten past, we have put on we have put on not on hold, but we have just dilly dallied for ever and ever, and it seems like we're used to dilly dallying. Uh, how what how could you prioritize the things that we need to change? Um, that seems so obvious. Um, that a lot of the, you know, part of the world has gotten past a long time ago. How, do, how can we prioritize and speed up those obvious things to get around to the newer ones? Sure, so that's a very good question. I think that the first one is um, political reform. The amount of money in the US in politics is absolutely unbelievable because mm -hmm. remember, it is not only um, Democrat versus Republican, US versus China, it's also the political class and us civilians. So that's an issue. It is the money spent through the media. You know, Biden just raised $3 million last month, one month. 
and that money will go into his war chest and be spent on media. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. So that is an important thing for us to consider as we reform. Mandatory voting, I'm a very big believer. It never occurred to me until I worked for the Australian government that that was possible. So political reforms are essential. I mix feelings about term limits um, because I think that there is a great deal of uh, uh, growth uh, or a great deal of um, positive in having folks that are um, dedicated, experienced um, political leaders. Right. Um, but I think that those, but also taking off the table things that are also just crazy, like not having health care for, for everybody. Um, some of these things will eventually change over time, but it only becomes possible if all of us have a way to um, uh, participate. Gerrymandering, awful. Okay. So the next question we have is uh, from Johnny on Facebook. Uh, it's, uh, he's, uh, he's trying to ask about uh, his, uh, your perspective on the capitalism versus socialism, uh, where uh, capitalism has uh, created significant wealth, but uh, uh, the, uh, there's uh, people who are disadvantaged in society uh, that it hasn't reached everyone. So that's being sure. taken out uh, on socialized programs and uh, ideologies. Uh, what do you think of uh, this? So that's a very good question, and it's a timely one given the wealth gap that has continued to develop um, in the United States. I will say um, that uh, socialism, uh, first of all, I don't think that wholesale socialism works. It can't work because when we centralize everything, there has never, ever been a time in modern history when a centralized um, economy um, has worked. Now, a lot of whether or not socialism works depends on how you define it. And clearly something um, is not working if the gap, if the average income in the United States is $45,000, which is flat to negative if you adjust it for time. So I don't think that we can simply tax our way out of it. I don't think that that works. Um, I don't think that um, uh, capitalism is um, replaceable by another system, but um, I think that if we continue to find um, ways of participating um, in our, our society, doing, um, uh, uh, here's, a, here's an idea. I would like if um, the very wealthy people that I know were able to see if they don't pay more in taxes, if they don't give uh, more industrial relations and work closer with unions, that eventually the mob is gonna come. You know, the guillotine was not that far away. Um, you know, those things happen and they happen um, more frequently than we realize. In fact, every time there was a Gilded Age, there was some kind of change that took that, that, took that away. But um, we have the greatest tool for educating ourselves right here in our hand. So we must be willing and aware to educate not only ourselves, but to educate um, our families and to take action. It's hard. It's very, very hard. There is not one fell swoop that will um, cure what ails us. Um, and the balance, the, the, uh, the uncertainty between socialism and capitalism, both of them are like salt when you're cooking. If you put too much in, it's very, it's, uh, it, it isn't good. In fact, it can be revolting. And if you don't put enough, it um, doesn't make the dish successful. You might have to throw out the oversalted one. But that's actually a shitty example, but you get the point. I think uh, Samia has a question. Um, thank you. And thank you, Abhijak, and thank you, David. That was, um, Fabulous. I would like you to help me connect mm -hmm. population needs mm -hmm. from food to clothing to shelter and 
you know, the, the saying is demography is destiny. Exactly. So when you have a, a pyramid that is not a pyramid, or mm -hmm. when you have populations of different ages that are so large, mm -hmm. versus the population that is young and not mm -hmm. so large, Mm -hmm. That is demography, and that is the destiny of the political structure, unless we change consumerism, unless, because in order for that change to happen, habits have to change. Well, I agree with you. I agree with you um, in philosophy, but the application of that, I think, is much harder. Because Absolutely the transition, how we transition from con consumption to something else um, is very hard to do in scale. Um, we could, and then many people have started to, it's become much more um, of a popular thing to live off the grid, right? To do more farming, to do more um, things ourselves, to live in a much more economical way. That is much harder, I believe, for the simple fact that our need and the opportunity that's presented by technology um, isn't going anywhere. Whether that is um, through healthcare, through the older age co cohorts, or whether that is through education for the younger folks. So demography is destiny, but there is a great deal of opportunity for growth in there as exemplified by Japan. It all comes with risks. It all comes with risks. And in many ways, you know, over the, we're only in 200 years of industrialization and only in a few decades of the information age because of time immemorial, we were an agricultural society. And um, this is new, right? This is new. So it, it, it's another one. Well, thank you for it. Um, I don't have an answer. Fair enough. Uh, we have uh, one more question. Uh, I guess that's uh, it's more. Uh, last question. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, we, uh, you have uh, any opinion on uh, underground movements like uh, all these uh, groups like QAnon and others and uh, the recent kidnapping? Uh, apparently, there was uh, something about the Michigan governor kidnapping. So uh, you have any? Uh, if, uh, thoughts on that? Sure. I think that these, um, that I don't, wouldn't call them movements. I don't think that that's a movement. I think it's an, an expression of um, powerlessness, of desperation, of a sense of um, trying to make sense of a world where people don't feel part of it. I guarantee you um, that folks like QAnon, they seek um, or adherents or believers in QAnon, they seek the same kind of connection that you all do here through the Houston Oasis, that folks that are your neighbors seek through church, that we often seek through Facebook. And I think it is a sort of a sense, um, because if you notice, it's a very US, United States kind of thing, that it is about feeling in control or some sort of control, but also not understanding what's happening. Also not understanding about how um, dysfunctional, not dysfunctional, how kind of primitive things are. If you worked in government, you would be shocked at how much bailing wire and duct tape there is. And not in a bad way, it's a good way. And it's just kind of how we work um, as societies. Um, or how we work as um, collective, messy organizations of people. But I think that those um, are expressions of panic. They are not new either. I mentioned earlier that my grandfather um, fought in World War II. My paternal grandfather was actually a uh, Pearl Harbor survivor. The, gen the, the Holocaust was exactly that. Germans at the time did not recognize their Germany. They were afraid. They sought an other on which to, that they thought for sure that they would be able to cure their bills. How awful and devastating is that? But I would say um, that they have a very hard time lasting. They have a very 
hard time um, uh, maintaining um, some degree of um, uh, um, sustained momentum because they're not based on facts. But make no mistake, they can do damage in between um, like the Michigan governor um, has experienced. So, you know, pay attention. I've actually been I'm educating myself a lot on propaganda, misinformation, the use of technology in um, uh, disinformation, deliberate. And I encourage you all to read it. It's kind of, it, it, again, it speaks a lot to human nature. Um, it speaks a lot to how the vast majority of us don't understand the technology and the effects of that technology, the, the, um, the bombardment, the volume that is put on our brain. And think objectively, think critically. Um, challenge one another in places like the Houston, uh, Houston Oasis. Thank you, David. That Welcome. has given us a lot to think about, which is really nice. Uh, very lovely talk. Thank you. Um,